Watch this. Can a church show support for political candidates or a political party? What about a leader of a church speaking from the pulpit? You know, we've seen a lot of that lately, even here in Idaho. And we got some answers from a tax attorney. Not that it's any clearer. We're down to days until the big day, and election offices are starting to hum with the activity of staff and the machines. Oh, they'll both be ready. There's not a lot of people looking for work, apparently. Unemployment is low. But there seems to be a lot of companies out there looking for people to work. Job fairs are one way employers can come together and also set themselves apart in this tight job market. There has been a lot of national attention recently with how church leaders have been behaving during this election cycle, publicly and from the pulpit, demonizing some candidates, endorsing others. The attention that has followed a lot of these statements have many pointing out how saying such things is a clear violation of a church's tax-exempt status because, well, they're usually considered a nonprofit organization under the law. Churches don't pay taxes on property or donations. Some of those accusations have even been aimed at Idaho churches. For example, a little more than two weeks ago, Idaho's GOP held a Keep Idaho Red rally in Coeur d'Alene, and they held it at the First Baptist Church, putting out this tweet on October 17th. Packed house tonight. Thank you, First Baptist Church, for opening your doors to our GOP candidates and for being there to speak and to voters for attending. It didn't take long for the American atheist to notice and retweet the Idaho GOP saying the next day, the First Baptist Church in Coeur d'Alene is breaking the law. Report them to the IRS. Even their president, Nick Fish, offered in a quote tweet of his own, they're just openly bragging about breaking the law now. It even got the attention of Newsweek, Idaho Church under fire for hosting GOP rally ahead of midterms. But even in their article, they admitted it is not entirely clear whether First Baptist Church violated the Johnson Amendment by hosting the event. That's the law being referred to when they say, they say, the First Baptist Church is breaking the law. The Johnson Amendment. It's a provision to the U.S. tax code implemented in 1954, named for then-Senator Lyndon Johnson. It's basically a part of the tax code that deals with what nonprofits can and cannot do politically. Nonprofits are known as 501c3s because, well, that's where they're identified and defined in the federal tax code. Paragraph 3 of subsection C of section 501 of title 25, 501c3. It says such organizations like the Idaho Humane Society or churches, for example, are absolutely prohibited from directly or indirectly participating in or inter intervening in any political campaign on behalf of or in opposition to any candidate for elective public office at the risk of losing their tax exempt status. So. Is a church allowing a political party to use its facility considered a violation of the exemption? We asked that question of a Boise-based tax attorney, Luke Gordon of Gordon Delich and Associates. He told us it's an area the IRS has avoided recently, especially since they faced significant failures when trying to enforce those rules back in the 1970s and 1980s. There were some very public cases against the Church of Scientology that, well, didn't go in their favor. In fact, the last time the IRS tried something like this was back in 1995. They were successful, however, and a New York church lost its tax-exempt status for taking out a full-page ad against then-presidential candidate Bill Clinton. Luke explained to us there are two parts to this exemption, the lobbying activity and there's the endorsing a political candidate portion. The 501c3 organizations cannot lobby on behalf of one, of a singular, singular political candidate. But the, the statute is pretty clear that it has to be on behalf of one, one particular candidate in order to um, not meet that second exem okay. exemption. Well, if it wasn't one, what if it was like more than a dozen? For example, the Keep Idaho Red Rally at the First Baptist Church in Coeur d'Alene, where a whole roster of Republican candidates stood up in front of those congregated and where they also offered a slew of political paraphernalia. That's where the issue of interpreting what behalf of a political candidate is, because that, that's the actual text of the statute. And a court could say that when it says on behalf of a political candidate, that means that it could be multiple political candidates at once. I think that is a very loose interpretation of the law, but it's definitely one that I could see a court coming to and, and making that decision. That if there's multiple, totally fine, but a singular one, then, then you're running into issues. Is there a 
factor when it comes to whether or not they charge for use of that space, is that crossing a line if they give it to them for free? If they're renting out the space at a fair market rate, then the church can use with what use its assets as it pleases. Even if it offers it for free, if it offers it to the public for certain things, then that, then that would be okay too. Okay, so any candidate, that's a go. The whole pallet, that's, well, I should say that's a no for one, but for the whole thing, it's a go, I guess. So we did reach out to the church and to the Idaho GOP to ask about how they were able to use that space. Was it offered for free or did they have to pay for it? We still haven't seen a response from either one of them, but the church did respond two days after that Keep Idaho Red rally to a publication called The Christian Post. And a spokesperson for the First Baptist Church told them the church did not endorse any specific candidate during the rally and that the Idaho GOP was allowed to use the facility only after the group accepted First Baptist Church mission statement and bylaws and agreed to open the event with a prayer and to remain respectful during the event. They went on to add the church allows the use of its facility to groups that agree to do the same. You've got to follow the bylaws, you've got to agree to promote Christian behavior, and you've got to open the event with a prayer. That applies to atheists, too, or even Democrats. However, Luke says the statute doesn't offer any balancing test either. So there's nothing that says they have to offer the same space to the opposition. And we asked the Democratic Party if they were offered that same space. They said they weren't. Okay, so that would be a reason why maybe the IRS wouldn't threaten the exemption of a church when there's an entire party of candidates brought in during a non-church activity. Okay, but what about a pastor who during a weekly meeting with his congregation says this? Because I've been asked over and over and over again by many of you in the room and others, uh, I would suggest to you that I am not going to endorse a candidate for governor at this point. Um, but I do like Ammon Bundy. I have to tell you that. Um, I will probably be voting for Ammon Bundy myself. Um, I can't vote for Brad Little. Um, and I can't vote for a Democrat. And so what I want to tell you then is that my vote, I will, at this point, will be for Ammon Bundy. Okay, so that is Pastor Paul Van Noy with the Candlelight Christian Fellowship in Coeur d'Alene. And he made that claim that he's going to vote for Ammon Bundy during, well, on October 19th, during a Wednesday night Q&A session at his church. Not a Sunday service, mind you, but still a room full of his regulars. So does this activity cross the line of participating in or intervening in any political campaign on behalf of a candidate for elective public office? Are they acting as an individual or are they acting as the organization? I think he chooses his words very carefully that he says, I am voting rather than any sort of, and then gives his reasons why the normal assumption from there is that, oh, then I should vote for him as well. But I think he chooses his words very carefully to try and walk that line of, I am speaking as an individual under my First Amendment right and not as the organization. Quite honestly, I, I think that the activity there definitely violates the spirit of the amendment. Like, I, I think that the amendment was created specifically to stop things like that because, you know, you do have a power differential between the pastor and, and the congregation, and the congregation trusts their pastor. I mean, that, that's kind of the beauty of, of religion is that you, you trust these people as, as your moral authorities. And so I think it's kind of this game of chicken that each you know each of them are playing that neither one of them wants the court to come down the opposite way and so they're each going to kind of push the line as much as they can so a church believing in and promoting a spirit while at the same time possibly violating the spirit of a law is certainly rich we can all see that right just to point out though luke is an attorney he's not a judge but bottom line it's a wide open interpretation here. Even Bloomberg Law put out a publication today reminding us these things have to be done in a nonpartisan fashion. Luke says he believes the IRS is reluctant to pursue any or many of these claims for a couple of reasons. One, it would be an expense to the taxpayer. Two, courts have shown a tendency to expand the free exercise of religion and of speech. And three, as you kind of heard him allude to right there, keeping a large gray area might keep more people avoiding it too afraid to kind of where that line is, you might cross it. And getting a court to openly say, well, this much is okay, well, that just might open the floodgates, he says. Not that we haven't already. So hopefully that answers your questions. So the Sunday before Election Day could obviously be an active one, quasi-politically, I'm saying, in Idaho churches. But those who are expected to be the most active on Election Day, county election officials, they've been tasked with making sure our election is free, fair, and, of course, legit. Joe Paris joins me now. Joe, what does creating this public trust 
kind of look like in terms of election day? Yeah, well, you can talk about the process and show data or even talk to the people that are in charge of the elections, but the best way to create trust is to do all of that and more. And the Ada County elections team hosted the media and the entire general public today was invited for their logic and accuracy test on the election equipment. And Saul Saylor with the Ada County Elections Division explained the process to me why they do it and the differences between their test today and the real show on Tuesday. Logic and accuracy is a final opportunity for us to not only test our own equipment, but also have the public come in and really take a look at our equipment and see how we go through the process. This is a final opportunity. After today, we're going to lock down this room. This room will be locked and secured all the way until Election Day. At that point, we'll open the room back up. Uh, on a day like today, we want the community to come in and be able to see the elections office and work. What we do is we mark a number of ballots beforehand. We run them through our machines just to ensure that everything is working properly and giving us the results that we really anticipate. The value of something like that is it builds confidence. You know, there's a lot of talk of elections integrity, and this is just another opportunity for us to show the public that we are doing everything we can to ensure a safe and fair election. It's the same process. We're using the same scanners. Uh, the ballots are programmed the same way. So this is a replica of what we'll be doing just to ensure that it is doing everything that we expect it to. This is showing our work. We've solved the problems already. If there's anything along those lines, that's been taken care of weeks ago. And at this point, we're showing our work to the public and we're ensuring that people have trust in the process. So this isn't a new thing. Ada County actually does this before major elections for transparency purposes, and that is a big thing, creating big trust. Again, Ada County, they also have on Election Day and heading into it, they have 24-hour cameras where you can watch the ballots and really how they're handled. So if you ever have a question about where your ballot is, specifically we can't say where it is, but all of them are in 24-hour live stream. Happens in real time. Okay, so one of those guys who's been usually very busy with Ada County Elections Office, at least yes. for the past 17 years, well, this year he's going to be the one watching results from the other side, correct? Yes, in part one of our interview series here on the 208, today I spoke with Ada County Clerk Phil McGrain. He's running for Secretary of State as the Republican candidate. His opponent, uh, Democrat Sean Keenan, we're expecting to talk to him tomorrow. But we've seen the, the, the messages from you into the newsroom. You want to know more about the candidates. Here's a profile of Phil McGrain. Ada County Clerk, Republican Phil McGrain, defeated Dorothy Moon and Mary Souza in the May Republican primary. So, why does McGrain want to be elected as the new Secretary of State? It's just a great opportunity with Secretary Denny retiring to step into that role and bring some of the hands-on experience I've learned over the years working on elections, counting ballots, training poll workers, and bring that to the Secretary of State's office. McGrain writes on his campaign website that he has worked with elections as far back as 2005 in Idaho. Since that time, McGrain says he has learned a lot through his role in the Ada County Clerk's Office, working with other clerks around Idaho. You know, it's easy to read Idaho code and say, here's what the law says. But on Election Day, when you have hundreds of thousands of people headed to the polls and you're trying to figure out the logistics, it can feel challenging in terms of how you actually implement that. And being able to have empathy and understanding for what's going on in the field, I think will be a real advantage coming into the office. In recent years, there's been a lot of discussions in our country and in Idaho about election integrity and security. McGrain says he believes he's a great person to lead Idaho elections, given his experience. The 2020 election brought so much attention to our elections. Um, when I started my career ages ago, it was right after the 2000 election with the hanging chad. And I think this is another big inflection point in terms of policy, in terms of elections, election integrity. And so being in a position, having experience and understanding what it means to run elections, but also hearing from the public and their concerns about building confidence in our elections. I think this is just a really unique opportunity to bring those skills and hopefully build trust in our elections. In recent years, some Idaho lawmakers have pitched changes to Idaho election law. McGrain says he believes he would be a good partner to work with them when talking about elections and election legislation. Many people don't realize things like we check signatures on every single absentee ballot that comes in, that our equipment is never connected to the Internet, that every Idahoan votes on a paper ballot. Those are just simple things and policies that we already have in place that help keep our elections secure. And so a lot of the questions related to the legislature is informing them about what we currently do. So before we start fixing things, let's understand where we are and what's working. McGrain says if elected, amongst his goals is something that he has heard Idahoans ask for, for years an official Idaho election voter guide from the Secretary of State's office. And so I'm going to be pitching to the legislature uh, the opportunity for us to provide a voter guide as a state. We currently do a pamphlet for uh, constitutional amendments and initiatives, but 
people want to know who's running in their county seats or who's, who are the judges that will be on the ballot. And right now there's no clean source for all that information. And so hopefully as Secretary of State, I'll be able to lead an effort to provide more information to voters. All right, you looking for a job? Well, the market is yours, statistically at least. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says Idaho's unemployment rate is below 3% for the eighth straight month. We are below where we were before we started the pandemic. Meanwhile, we're in the middle of a labor shortage. We talk about it all the time here on the 208. The relationship between employers and employees has certainly changed. The worker has more leverage than in years past. So what does that process look like for someone who's now in a job hunt? The Nampa Civic Center hosted a job fair today, putting the process on full display. And here's Andrew Bartline. It's a bustling bunch, bouncing from booth to booth, where the palette blends together, developing a relationship stands out. What is this? But Christopher Milliner already knows that. This is cards. But. Or else he wouldn't be here in the first place. I made a big move from Ohio to Idaho. Um, I met someone online and uh, basically just followed the love. Love make you travel across different states to get here. Here, he finds 55 employers looking to ink his name, all trying to lure a disproportionately small labor market onto their team. Tactics include branded water, branded clothes, branded pamphlets, and Lego highlighters. To these, Christopher's not biting because he knows what he wants. Some um, that fits my uh, character, fits my personality. So I've left some resume with different ones. Yeah, absolutely. Christopher is looking to start a relationship. You can sense there's a lot of job opportunity available to the masses, right? It's just finding that right niche that fits you. Christopher's right. While several industries face a labor shortage, Idaho's unemployment rate is still less than 3%, meaning employers have less choices. I think it's a good thing. Brandon Slater's a salesman. Where the market is currently right now with employees having a little bit more say in what they want. Slater's pest control company is local, and he admits the reality of the labor market has changed the relationship with employees. And now I think it's a little more lenient in terms of what the employees can get away with. Um, but it is definitely a dance. You have to find that happy medium of, okay, it's a give and take, but at the same time, there needs to be that mutual respect of, I'm the boss and you're the employee. That relationship, Slater says, is becoming more casual because if job interviews are dates, only one out of 10 make it to courtship. I think people learn what the job entails over the interview process, and then they kind of realize that it's not for them. But Christopher? Okay. All right. He's looking for a serious partner. What's next for me is uh, locking it in. Because he knows relationships. I married this young lady that I, I fell in love with. So that's what's next for me. And looking for a job these days, that's no different. I'm telling you, it goes hand in hand, brother. It goes hand in hand. 
Brandon Slater at that pest control company adds it's competitive out there and his industry has an added hurdle, their door-to-door -door sales. So it takes a specific personality that they'd be looking for. And with so many options of employers to choose from, it could be hard to compete with other employers and attract that right type of candidate. And Brian, I also talked with a beverage distributor too. Mm -hmm. He says you gotta be up at 4 a.m. to work there and do that job. Well, that's another hurdle because yeah. there's probably a nine to five in that room or you can just work at a desk. So it is very competitive amongst those companies and those employers to try to attract the person they want. A lot of fish in the sea, as you say, and it, a relationship brought him here. Now he's looking to build another relationship with employee. I like that analogy, that's great. Thank you very much, Andrew. Welcome along. We're on the, the edge of a huge change in this weather, as you've probably been hearing about it. So let me give you a few ideas on this. First of all, the temperature tonight is down to 32 degrees. It starts out with a little bit of rain, but changes to snow. Snow about anywhere between about 6 to 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Watch that for the morning commute. As you get into uh, later tomorrow, we still see some rain showers off and on that continue into Saturday morning. But some of these showers could actually, they'll be scattered around the area for the Bronco game. But keep in mind, it is drying up a little. Now, remember, after the game, time change, turn back an hour. Scatter showers for Sunday. Monday and Tuesday, another storm system comes in. And when we look at that, there's a chance of some more rain and snow. But I'll tell you, as we get into next week, we have more storms. And those storms last at least the next 7 to 10 days. And when you look at the 10-day temperature trend toward the end of next week, look at these high temperatures. Now they're in the 30s, upper 30s in most spots. And then when you look at the low temperatures, they're down into the 20s at night, which means we've got a good combination of temperatures as well as precipitation coming in to see more snow actually developing into more of a snowy forecast as we get into next week. But we'll keep you informed as we watch it. We're going to have more coming up soon.
All right, final moment here on the 208 on this Thursday. Let's get to your comments like this one from Angela and Payette. Is it legal for election workers to ask you what party you belong to before handing you your ballot? Generally, in the primary, they ask which ballot you would like. But during the general election, it shouldn't matter what party you belong to, and they just give you a ballot because we're all voting on the same ballot. So, no, they shouldn't, as far as I know, not be doing that. I wish they would take away all church religion tax exemptions, and they can then endorse whoever they choose. The politics line with a lot of churches is not blurred. It is obliterated, says Paul. And there's a lot of people out there who seem to agree with you these days. Knock it off with the Bundy slamming. The pastor you featured has every right to express his opinion about his individual voting preference. Holmes, that's from Bim in Jerome, by the way, sent that in later. But I don't believe that we're Bundy slamming. In fact, we were pointing out that the pastor did have a right to say who he is choosing to vote for. That's his personal preference, and he wasn't asking his congregation to do that. That was kind of the point of the story was to say, yeah, some of these things are allowed within the rules. Was that an endorsement, asked Jim, meaning the pastor of Van Noy not saying, this is an endorsement now, but I could and I would like to vote for. He has endorsed candidates as recently as a couple weeks ago. The three Republican-backed candidates for the North Idaho College School Board, he endorsed those three and had them in his church service on a Sunday to talk to his congregation. Where are the videos of churches promoting Democratic candidates? I'm very sure they are out there, too. Send, send them to us. We'd like to see them. I wonder if there are. It'd be interesting. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good night.